We all know bird shot is an inflammatory autoimmune disease, and it's these two kind of sides of things, the inflammation and this autoimmunity, that I think are more interesting when we're looking at nutrition, but also why nutrition is important to us. Mostly because we want to keep healthy. We do have, we're using immunosuppressants. Secondly, we want to look at reducing this inflammation to make sure that we are avoiding kind of flare-ups to help kind of combat those. The thing that I struggled with most was the side effects of the medications, not actually the birdshot itself. So it's coping with those uh, side effects and seeing what we can do to kind of make things better in terms of particularly uh, with steroids. This is a little bit small, so you probably won't be able to see this, but this was a study done in 2012, and this man, Egger, was looking at kind of possible inflammatory triggers in the kind of modern life. And what he saw was that kind of pre the kind of Neolithic and the Neolithic Revolution, we can see here there's lots of anti-inflammatory things above the line here. So things like breast milk, fish, fiber, veg, nuts and seeds, and essential fatty acids, all these things were positive. These were anti-inflammatory in our diet. And as we've kind of moved throughout the ages, we can kind of see here on the bottom, these things which are kind of pro-inflammatory uh, diet. So these are things like air pollution, smoking, high amounts of saturated fats, higher energy intake than energy expenditure, inactivity, sleep deprivation, stress, not having inadequate levels of essential fatty acids, fast foods, and so forth. And we can start to see a bit about how our kind of lifestyle has switched a bit and what impact this might be having on the overall prevalence of autoimmune disease which we know has been been rising how this might be useful for us so we're going to start by looking at these essential fatty acids and i think this is a really interesting area of research uh, and one there's more and more studies every year that come out so what are essential fatty acids these are a family of fats called the omega-3 and the omega-6 fatty acids and we can't make them within the body. A lot of fats we can chop around and repackage and make different uh, types of fatty acids in the body. But with these omega-3 fatty and 6 fatty acids, we need to consume them. We can't make them within the body. There's lots of research showing how they have these anti-inflammatory properties in, in the body. And this is what we want to kind of focus on, particularly with the omega-3. And of these, in, within these families, it's these two acids in particular, EPA and DHO, which are known to be particularly important. We have huge amounts of DHA in our brain and every cell membrane we have in the body has a kind of fat layer around it. Having these essential fatty acids within that cell membrane helps the communication between cells in the body. So the number of things that are involved in the body is just immense. So it used to thought, it's not just about having these fats that's important, it's about the balance between these two groups of essential fatty acids, so these omega-3 and omega-6. And ideally, looking back in those Neolithic times, we would have a ratio of around about kind of three to five omega-6s to one omega-3. So I'll give you an example. So we find most omega-6s we'll find in vegetable oils, nuts and seeds, uh, and particularly things like sunflower oils, high in omega-6. And omega-3 you find in your oily fish, your fatty fish. But what we found is that this balance between these two essential fatty acids has been changed in our modern diet. We no longer feed our cattle on grass, we feed them on grain. We need a lot more vegetable oils than we used to. If you look now and try and buy biscuits that are made out of butter, it's pretty impossible, they're made out of palm oil now. Uh, so we've now increased our intake of omega-6 in the diet, but our increase of omega-3 from these oily fish has really declined over the years. And we think that may have shifted our bodies to a more pro-inflammatory state rather than like an anti-inflammatory state. So looking at kind of optimizing how much omega-3 we have in our diet is really important. So where do we get it from? So oily fish, so the salmon, from trout, sardines, uh, herring, all these kind of sources of good source of oily fish. Grass-fed red meat. So for people out there who enjoy a nice bit of red meat, don't be discouraged, you can still have your red meat. But if you were to choose grass-fed meat, that's going to be a healthier source of your, uh, uh, for your diet than would be a grain-fed meat. Organic meat has to have a certain percentage of grass fed, but they can also have some grain as well. It's a better choice of meat. So you can find these things, but you do have to ask. You've got a good butcher, ask him. Um, so the fatty acid composition of grass-fed meat is much more beneficial than grain-fed meat. Uh, Flaxseed or linseed um, and pumpkin seed are also good sources of omega-3 if you're a vegetarian and don't fancy the meats uh, and fishes.
So omega-3 in bird shop, let's see, what do we know about this? Um, so studies in mice, and this is quite a common theme, there'll be a lot of studies in mice and rats, so if you're against this, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of this in the, in the presentation. So studies have found that omega-3 fatty acids suppress experimental autoimmune uveitis and with this TH17 function in mice. And this is really interesting. So uh, not getting too technical, but what we know in our immune system is we have something, there's something called TH17, and that's involved with what's called immune tolerance. This is where your body helps you to distinguish between whether it should react to something or not. And ideally, we want our body to be able to know whether something is a kind of foreign invader, or whether this is part of self. So encouraging um, suppression, so encouraging immune tolerance in the body is really important. Other studies in mice have found that uh, EPA supplementation um, have reduced ocular inflammation. None of these studies, though, are on birdshot uveitis. These are normally on anterior uveitis, so at the front. So it's not the same uh, as our uveitis, but it still shows there may be something interesting here for, for us to uh, look at. And there is consistent evidence to suggest that omega-3 fatty acids may act in a protective role against uh, uh, inflammatory and age-associated pathology of vascular and neural retina. So there's enough research to show in the general area of looking at ocular inflammation and some uveitis that shows omega-3 to be beneficial. But these studies are limited, they're mostly done on mice, and there's nothing directly looking at birdshot, but it's still an interesting angle. And we also know that omega-3 and its anti-inflammatory properties from its oily fish have great benefits in a number of diseases, so cardiovascular disease, any disease where there's looking at inflammation. Also, we know that this omega-3 fatty acids can help our body be more sensitive, sensitive to insulin. So when we're looking at things like raised blood sugar levels or increased risk of diabetes, omega-3 might be something here that's kind of interesting or beneficial for us. Next, we're going to look at a little bit about vitamin D. So this is the sunshine vitamin. And this, I think, is a really interesting one. So there are vitamin D, although it's called a vitamin, but really, essentially, it has a role to kind of pro-hormone in the body. We have receptors for vitamin D pretty much in every cell in our body. We're only just beginning to kind of scratch the surface of what the role of vitamin D might have. We used to just think it was for essential for bone growth and for, for maintaining bone mass density, which is certainly interesting, and one of the side effects of steroids that you have is reduced bone density. That's something that could be interesting for you. The main source of vitamin D is from the action of sunlight on the skin. It needs to be strong enough. May and September in the UK, you can make vitamin D on your skin. After that, in the winter, the action of sunlight is not strong enough and we can't make uh, uh, vitamin D on our skin. And also we tend to find that most of the time in the summer we're either covered up or we've got sunscreen on and we're not making enough vitamin D. Dietary sources of vitamin D, there are some but they're pretty low. So you can get it in cod liver oil, some oily fish, but it's very small amounts. Um, a lot of foods you'll see that had vitamin D added to it, again the amount of these functional foods is very low. The best is from exposure to kind of sunlight. So just to give you an idea of uh, deficiency, well, so every year there's this um, national uh, diet and nutrition survey done in the UK, and they pick a whole bunch of people and they give them blood tests. And so they've been able to measure the vitamin D status of the population uh, looking at these, um, using this annual testing. And what we've seen here is it looks at various different age groups. We can see in the adult kind of population from uh, 19 to 64, 24% of men are vitamin D deficient and 22% of women are vitamin D deficient. That's a huge percentage of the population. This gets higher if you're looking at people who are in institutions, so prisons, hospitals, care homes. And it also gets higher if you've got people with darker skin, mixed ethnicities, because they are not uh, as able to produce uh, vitamin D. So we can start to see this actually is a real, real, a real issue for us. So why is vitamin D important for us? Well, one of the properties about uh, vitamin D is that it's known to be an immune modulator. So epidemiological data, so looking at populations, has shown that vitamin D levels, low vitamin D levels, are associated with many different chronic diseases, so cardiovascular disease, diabetes. The evidence is limited, though, and it's a bit inconsistent. There's no direct studies on birdshot and vitamin D, but a 2016 study found that low serum vitamin D levels in patients with acute uh, anterior uveitis. So again, front of the eye, not back of the eye, 
One of the um, proposals of why vitamin D might be so important for immune disease is because it impacts on this Th17, this immune tolerance uh, factor again, and it improves our tolerance and so lowers the production of these inflammatory these, uh, cytokines, which are like messengers within the body that start this kind of cascade of inflammation. So again, this could be something, not only just from a bone health perspective if you're on steroids, but this could be something interesting for us. First of all, you've got to find out, are you deficient in vitamin D? So whether your vitamin D can affect a lot of things, genetic things, we both we use vitamin D uh, uh, in our, in our, once we've made it in the sun, we can store it for about three months in our body. Some people can store it for longer, some people use it faster than others. All that is influenced by your genes. We tend to store that vitamin D in our fat cells and we don't unlock it for use in the body. So studies have found that the higher your body mass index, the more likely you are to be vitamin D uh, deficient. Uh, again, if you're so specific at risk groups of people aged over 65, people who don't go in the sun much, darker skins, and those who are obese. So two weeks ago, the SACEM, which is the Science, Scientific Advisory Council on Nutrition, which works for the Department of Health, released this report re-evaluating vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, is that everyone over the age of four, that should say, uh, should consume 10 micrograms, so that's 400 IU of vitamin D daily. And that's the general population. So then we've got to ask ourselves, A, what's my status? And also, is this enough for bird shot? Is this enough for someone with an autoimmune condition? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the first places you can start by this is knowing your numbers. So we know that uh, your vitamin D levels will be higher in the summer. So around about this time of year, if you test your vitamin D levels, they should be the highest. And then by the time we get to kind of February, March, that should be your trough, your low level for the year. So what you might want to start experimenting is, what is your end of summer number like? What is your kind of February, March number like? To see if you're ever dropping into that insufficient or deficient area. It's a very simple blood test. If you're being monitored um, uh, through your consultant or hospital, they'll do this normally for you as part of your markers. If you're on steroids, this is something I would definitely recommend that you get done. And then they can advise you on what's a kind of decent level. This 400 IU, I would call that minimum base level that you should be having each day. I would suggest probably for the, for the winter you'd be looking at a higher number than that, but that's something you can talk about either with your consultant or rheumatologist if you have one. But I think this is an interesting area to make sure that this is something we can all do to make sure that we're not deficient. The next area is a bit newer, is this idea of kind of plant power, these things called phytochemicals. I don't know how many people know about I've heard about phytochemicals. So we all think that fruit and veg is really important because we've got lots of minerals and nutrients and fiber in it. And all that's true, but what we have in plants are called phytochemicals. And these are chemicals that the plant makes in itself to protect itself. To protect itself from pests, from pollution, from sunlight. And all of these phytochemicals, and there are loads of difference in them, then when we eat the fruit and veg, have a, have impacts with, with our own system as well. So these hundreds of different compounds, some of these you would have heard of, so lycopene in tomatoes, um, uh, you'll get, uh, so we've got curcumin in turmeric, all these different kind of, kind of flavonoids you might have had, all of these, and these kind of quite, quite potent phytochemicals have some quite interesting impacts on the body. And there's now a lot of research looking at these phytochemicals and their health benefits. So one of the things that we all know, but perhaps don't realise why this is so important, is that we should be having a decent amount of fruit and veg every day. The government recommendation is five portions, about 80 grams each. I don't really think that's probably enough for us. I think we probably should be looking at seven to nine portions of fruit and veg a day, mostly kind of veg. Why? Because we maximise them on these phytochemical kind of compounds. So all the kind of looking at population data has shown that a high intake of, of uh, phytochemicals from vegetables, fruits, nuts and legumes is associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and other long-term diseases. So it's really powerful, this kind of population data on something quite small. Let's look at a couple of these. So turmeric, uh, I don't know if you've used the kind of yellow spice before, it contains something called curcumin, which is the pigment part of it. It's a member of the ginger family. Um, and it's proposed to have these anti-inflammatory properties. And it inhibits these activation, these inflammatory factors, and the main one being this nuclear factor kappa B, which is like kind of the, the daddy of the inflammatory cascade in the body. 
um, and it can also kind of help dampen down some of these inflammatory messengers in the body. So again, potentially really interesting. There's no clinical studies looking at curcumin and birdshot, but there is one looking at uh, anterior uveitis again, and this is quite small, you won't be able to kind of read this, but it says, in conclusion, our study is the first to report the potential therapeutic role of curcumin and its efficacy in eye-relapsing diseases such as anterior uveitis. And this is something you can either use in cooking, um, quite, you know, on an everyday kind of basis. We've seen it used um, in India. It's kind of used daily in their kind of cooking. Um, and uh, benefits eye inflammatory and degenerative conditions such as dry eye, uh, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. So again, potentially quite an interesting area of, of study. But it's not very bioavailable. So if you're going to take human tablets or supplements, you need to take them with some fat, because it's fat soluble, and it's also rapidly uh, conjugated, metabolized, and excreted in the body. Some people use black pepper to enhance it, but if you have gallbladder disease, you do need to be very careful taking turmeric, because that can increase your gallbladder contractions. So that's something you should be wary of. A lot of Sorry, when you say rapidly metabolized and conjugated, yeah. you mean it's in and out of the body very fast? Exactly. Basically, we, we metabolize it, we break it down, we, we stick it with another kind of component of the body and we excrete it straight out. So if you take the fat with it, it keeps it in the body longer? Is that what it helps you absorb a little bit more. It doesn't, it doesn't stay in your system for much longer. Right. And what this size is showing is you don't actually need a high amount of it. You just need a small, tiny amount constantly in your right. diet. Right. So the Indian way of having turmeric uh, in your rice every day is probably actually a very healthy way of um, right. doing it. Um, but with, if, you're take, if you're having food, you don't have to worry necessarily about gallbladder disease. If you're taking it as a supplement, you should be aware of a couple of things. One is it can cause your gallbladder to contract more, which if you've got gallbladder disease could be dangerous. Uh, secondly, there is a question about whether it may interact with anticoagulant and antiplatelet uh, drugs. And there's also an interesting point in one of the kind of papers I came across that said that because it has this impact in terms of reducing this inflammatory cascade, it may, on top of immunosuppressant drugs, then have an impact in terms of your immune response. So again, that may be something you want to talk to with your consultant about. This is one of my favourite ones. Um, it's called pycnogenol. It's actually uh, it's called pine bark, and it's a herbal uh, extract. And it contains several of these bioflavones, these plant chemicals, which are then meant to have anti-inflammatory uh, properties. But there are a couple of studies saying that pine bark has been uh, beneficial in terms of lowering blood pressure and blood sugar levels, but also this anti-inflammatory properties again. Quercetin is another of these phytochemicals you find in grape skins, green tea, red onions, tomatoes, apples uh, and other plants. And that's shown to modulate an allergic response by reducing inflammation in, in the body. There are limited studies uh, on quercetin, but one has found that it Quercetin supplementation led to reduced uh, retinal inflammation, which again could be potentially kind of interesting for us. But this is a great food, this is a great phytochemical because we can get this from loads of our food. So we can eat red onions, apples, all these things on quite a regular basis without necessarily having to fork out for for, um, for supplements. And I think the message I'd like to kind of get across is really that having as much brightly coloured fruit and veg is the best way to go because you're going to get all these things naturally. I thought I'd also stick lutein in and the anthem as well because these are ones that often people talk about eye health and again these are uh, carotenoids again these phytochemicals and they've been shown to reduce uh, kind of cataract development and macular degeneration uh, and be anti-inflammatory. The mechanism is really interesting because it's thought that what they do is absorb blue light so they have them in plants fruits and vegetables to protect them from the kind of UV light. And there's some research going on at the moment in terms of looking at the benefits of uh, red light in terms of protecting us from damage in our eyes. So this could be something that could be quite an interesting area of study. But again, food sources, immense food, food sources, egg yolk, maize, orange pepper, kiwi, spinach, anything nice and brightly coloured, dark green leafy veg. So again, decent portions of these every day. You're going to be getting a great amount of these nutrients naturally. They're also fat soluble, so they're best absorbed when eating with a little bit of fat. So if you're having your fruit and veg with a little bit of olive oil or a little bit of butter, it's going to be much better for you than just having your fruit and vegetable kind of raw. So one of the areas I wanted to look on a bit was blood sugar balance and the difference about, and this is one I think which, is, which can uh, impact inflammation in our body quite strongly. And also if we're looking at being on steroids, of balancing our blood sugar becomes really important. 
So this is the difference between the unrefined and the refined kind of carbohydrates. And essentially, anything that involves kind of food industry too heavily is going to put you on the unrefi on the uh, refined side of things. So why is it that these refined carbohydrates are so bad? It's not just that they don't have very much fibre in them that's been taken out of the processing. It's not just that they have reduced amounts of vitamins and minerals. The key thing is the impact they have on our blood sugar levels. So to give you an example, when we have, when you eat a bit of white bread, most of the work has been done for you already. They've taken out the outside bit of the, of the, of the, of the, of the grain. So essentially, when you put that bit of bread in your mouth, so if you, you put a white bit of bread in your mouth, and you probably did this at school, so my school experiment, you hold a bit of white bread in your mouth, and after about a few minutes, it tastes a bit sweet in your mouth, because you're already breaking that down, the enzymes in your mouth are already breaking it down into the sugars that make up that uh, carbohydrate. If you put a pea in your mouth, how long do you reckon you could hold it in your mouth before it goes sweet? Pretty much days, because we've got the whole outside husk of that pea, which is preventing that sugar from being broken down. So these refined carbohydrates, and I mean by that bread, so white flour, white bread, white pasta, biscuits, all these things are really rapidly digested. So you absorb that sugar really quickly into your bloodstream. And because it rises so quickly, the sugar in your blood, we produce a hormone called uh, insulin, which helps to take the sugar out of our blood, because we slightly panic when our blood sugar levels get too high. But we produce, because our blood sugar levels rise too quickly, because all this digestion has been done for us, we over-release insulin. And what that means is that a couple of hours later, our blood sugar levels are lower than we, when we first started eating. And that is at least fat storage. It's also a stress to the body. It promotes inflammation in the body. At least these dips of blood sugar, where you're going to feel tired, you're not going to feel great, you're a bit irritable, and you're going to reach for a cup of coffee and a Kit Kat. And what happens is that this then happens throughout the day, we go from, we struggle from going from the croissant or power shop in the morning, a nice dip afterwards, a coffee and a Kit Kat, dip again, then we go for the big sandwich at lunchtime. And this happens, keeps on happening throughout the day. So what we're doing is we're releasing insulin, falling, it, our sugar's falling too low, we're wanting some stimulant, we're storing fat here, it's quite stressful for the body. So what happens you know, if our blood sugar levels fall too low? Does anyone know? Eventually, you go unconscious and you die. So our body has loads of hormones to stop us, stop this from happening. So essentially, when our blood sugar level gets low, this diagram just shows you here, this is the blood sugar levels, and this is the time um, after you've um, had your meal. Ideally, what happens when you have a meal is you, it, your blood sugar levels rise slowly, a little bit of insulin is released, and then you drop back down this blue line here to kind of slightly above kind of normal, for a few hours and you should feel nice and satisfied. If you have a high sugar meal, you follow this pink line, you get a massive rise uh, in, in blood glucose, the body panics, it releases insulin, and then we go a, a low dip a few hours later. And it doesn't matter how much you've had to eat, your body can't tell. If I'm having a plate of pasta, let's say, which made white pasta, which has 300 calories in, or I'm having a piece of fish and some uh, vegetables, also let's say 300 calories, your body can't tell when you're eating that pasta. It doesn't know how much is coming in or out. It just sees lots of sugar flooding towards it really quickly. So it releases that insulin. Even, it doesn't know whether that's going to go on for five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour. It just sees the rate at which you're absorbing that sugar. So this is not a very great mechanism because before in olden times it worked greatly because if you're eating fruit and veg, it took a bit of time to break down. So that it was a good indication of the sugar when it's coming in. Nowadays when the fine carbs, it's not. So we want to avoid these dips because they're stressful to the body. Because here, we get a low, we'll be reducing adrenaline. If you haven't eaten for, for a very long time, you get that sudden shaky feeling, that means your body has released uh, adrenaline in order to raise your blood sugar levels. It uses cortisol to do the same thing. So this is stressful to the body and it's pro-inflammatory in the body. So we want to avoid this. And if this carries on for too long, what happens is your body then no longer becomes sensitive to the insulin anymore. And this is when, a pre, it's when you become pre-diabetic or diabetic. So, how do we manage our carbohydrate intake? So, if you can break carbohydrates down into your fibrous foods, these are your above ground veg, um, starchy ones, which are your roots or your grains, and then some carbohydrates are a mixture of things like pulses and chickpeas and lentils, a mixture of fibrous and starchy. So, what's the best way then to eat your carbohydrates throughout the day? So, ideally, you want to start in the morning with your starchy carbohydrates. These contain quite a lot of energy within them. 
And then as the day goes on, you want to switch to having more fibrous carbohydrates, so more veg in the evening. So you have your porridge or your wholemeal toast in the morning, but by the evening, you're looking at more kind of veg and salads. And this helps you also kind of taper um, the amount of sugar and kind of uh, the amount of carbohydrates and sugar that coming into your system. So it means you're going to give your body a nice break overnight where you have a lower amount of uh, insulin in your system. And we'll come to this with, with blood sugar balance later. So, how to keep your blood sugar levels normal? And why is this so we're keeping our blood sugar levels balanced so we're not being having kind of uh, promoting inflammation in the body? And we're also helping us to cope with some of the side effects of things like steroids in the system. So what do you want to do to keep your, to balance your blood sugar? Well, first you want to avoid these foods that release their sugar really quickly. So these high glycemic foods, so things high in food and sugar, processed foods, refined carbohydrates. And also things like fruit juices and dried fruits, again, also very high in, uh, in sugar. So we want to um, replace with unrefined carbohydrates. So replace your white bread with brown bread, brown rice, brown pasta, seeded bread. We also want to eat protein at each meal. So what does protein do? We'll come on to protein a little bit more, so I'm going to leave you hanging on that one. But protein is essentially your friend and is the best way of reducing your blood sugar levels. So making sure you have a bit of protein in every meal. So a bit of meat, a bit of fish, egg, nuts, seeds, pulses. Great way to keep your... Um, sugar response after meal though. Increase your intake of these soluble fibre, these fruits and vegetables, we know they're wonderful because they've got these phytochemicals in. What they also do is they delay the rate at which your stomach empties after a meal because it has to kind of, try and chew up all this fibre, it takes a lot of effort in the stomach. Also potentially using herbs, things like cinnamon in your diet, have been shown to be very beneficial in reducing your fasting blood glucose levels. Uh, particularly in those people who have uh, elevated blood glucose. So if you are having kind of, uh, if you are uh, taking high levels of steroids at the moment, adding a bit of cinnamon into your porridge uh, can be a great way of helping your body to kind of cope with those kind of, of higher blood glucose levels after a meal. So protein, why is it your friend? First of all, it's going to keep you feeling full. So if you're feeling fuller for longer, it's going to uh, mean you're not going to eat as much food. So your cravings, when your appetite rises when you're on steroids, you're going to, by having protein, it's going to keep you feeling kind of fuller. It reduces this glycemic uh, index in a in load in a mixed meal because it's broken down very slowly. It also supports lean muscle mass. You can eat as much pasta as you like, but you ain't going to build any muscle out of it. You need protein to build muscle. And maintaining our muscle mass is what keeps us active and healthy. It also burns more calories, our muscle mass, and it's something we can tend to be weakened if you're on steroids for prolonged periods. It's also a really inefficient fuel protein. Our body can burn protein for energy, but it just doesn't like to. So if I give you 100 grams of mashed potato, 100 grams of kind of carbohydrate, pretty much, use about 5% of that to burn it in your body, but pretty much you've got 95 calories to go. The same with fat. If I give you 100 grams of fat, you, it, you eat it, it doesn't take much to process in the body, you've pretty much got 100 grams of fat to eat. If I give you 100 grams of protein to eat, it takes you a lot to break it down. It's got these complex bonds, our temperature has to rise to break it down. We use about 25% of the energy in protein just to break it down. So if you're going to fill yourself with anything, protein and vegetables is the way to go, because both of those things can have a great impact in terms of you balancing your blood sugar levels. So how much should you be having? So the diet you reference down in the UK is about 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight. So you have to work that out yourself. Um, and that's for a kind of normal sedate individual. So for a 90 kilo man, it's about two to two and a half chicken breasts a day. And for a 65 kilo woman, that's about one and a half to two chicken breasts a day. If you're going to be active, then you could use up to about one, one to 1.2 kilos uh, grams per kilo of body weight a day. So that kind of gives you a rough idea of how much protein you should be having. And then really quickly, fats. Um, so we've said fat is really essential for cell membranes and also for absorbing these fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E and K. It's a primary energy store in the body. So fat, we shouldn't be afraid of having fat in our diet, but we should be careful of the types of fats we've had. We've already talked about how these essential fatty acids are really beneficial for us. So fat is only dangerous when we consume it in excess, when we're eating more fat than we're actually doing in terms of exercise. 
and excess saturated fat can be pro-inflammatory in the body. So we want to mix, we want to kind of choose leaner cuts of meat. Um, so mix up the type of fats we're having, having some good kind of oils, olive oil, avocado, some fish, some essential fatty acids. These are all good fats to have in our diet. Um, so if you enjoy a bit of full fat yogurt, don't be afraid to have that. Enjoy that bit of yogurt. Don't feel you have to always pick low fat foods. But just think about yourself, think about your daily activity levels. If you are not a very active person, consuming large amounts of saturated fat is not going to be your friend long term. What's also dangerous is when we consume fats or we've manipulated the structure. By that I mean uh, when we're using trans fats or we're using food processing. Mr. Kipling's cakes keep a very long time. The shelf life of them is a kind of you know two kind of eighteen months to two years. I don't know if you've ever made a cake and tried to keep it for two years. It's not pleasant. So we have to be careful of some of these fats that have been manipulated uh, by kind of food processing. So cooking from scratch is always going to be a better way uh, to to go. So steroids, uh, the kind of necessary evil sometimes. But let's look at some of the side effects. So weight gain. It's a big side effect for many people who take steroids. So how can you combat that? So balancing your blood sugar levels, uh, we've talked about, is going to be an excellent way for you to not promote fat storage just from your general diet. You could be having a calorie-controlled diet, but if your balanced sugar levels, your, if your blood sugar levels are not balanced, you could be promoting fat storage, um, uh, which could be really frustrating if you're then on steroids as well. Making sure you're doing appropriate exercise because that helps to reduce your blood sugar levels. Portion control. Now this is a really hard one because our appetite increases when we're on steroids. So you want to kind of think about your plate and use protein and vegetables as your friend. So pile your plate up high, but make it heavier on the protein and the vegetable side of things than it is on the refined carbohydrates and the starchy carbohydrates. I would advise leaving out leaving starchy carbohydrates out of your evening meal. So have your uh, spaghetti bolognese, but try it on uh, courgette noodles instead of with a large salad. Have a bit of baked fish, but with a large plate of, kind of uh, roasted vegetables instead. Try some of the things to see if you can kind of, so you're still engaged, still enjoying and engaging your appetite, but you're just not feeding it the foods which are going to kind of promote uh, high blood sugar levels. Sleep disruption again is a big one, and to a certain extent, we can't really avoid this when you're on very high levels of steroids. But make sure you take your steroids first thing in the morning, morning with some food so that you're not having high levels of corticosteroids at night when you're trying to go to sleep. Establish a good bedtime routine and kind of sleep hygiene. What do I mean by that? Going to bed at the same time, making sure you are giving yourself enough time to sleep. Make sure your room is dark enough and cold enough to sleep in. Not using your iPads or iPhones five minutes before you go to bed. That blue light will stimulate uh, your brain and make it harder for you to switch off. Avoid caffeine after 2 p.m. And also potentially try uh, magnesium as a supplement that's often used to promote sleep. Um, so if you take a magnesium supplement an hour before bed, that can help you uh, relax. It's a vasodilator, it's a relaxer in the body. Lots of bone ma uh, mass density we've talked about earlier in terms of vitamin D. So check your vitamin D levels, uh, consider supplementation. Uh, also look at calcium. And uh, an exercise is going to be a key one here. So maintaining a decent amount of exercise each day to promote your bone mass is going to be vital. Increased irritability, anxiety and mood changes. Again, these are really tough things to struggle with and don't make you kind of pleasant to be around. So balancing your blood sugar level again is going to be really key. So you're not having these dips where you are feeling kind of, uh, kind of low energy or kind of irritable. That's going to be helpful. Making sure trying to get that uh, sleep routine in place. Taking some time each day to kind of relax and try, uh, and this can be a really hard thing to say. When you're irritable and someone says relax, it's almost more irritating. Um, but it is then a question of, can I use things like breathing techniques? Can I try a yoga class? Have I, can I try one of these apps like Headspace where it kind of takes me, uh, helps me to relax? Try one of those before you go to bed. It might make a difference between you feeling a bit calmer when you're lying in bed or you lying there feeling really frustrated because you can't sleep. Other things we can look at in terms of, kind of irritation of this gastric tissue, again, of our, of our gut. So make sure you take the steroid tablets with food and ask for these enteric coated uh, tablets if you're taking steroids. Raise blood pressure and fluid retention. So one of the uh, main culprits uh, we can look at in our diet is salt. Um, and beware of this hidden salt in food. So high, having high salt in your diet essentially will lead you to uh, retain more water. So be careful things like ready meals, soups and sauces for your salt intake. 
However, potassium is the kind of antidote to salt. So having more fruit and veg in your diet, it's a theme again, a pro fruit and veg, is going to help you to combat the effects of sodium. Also, there are certain diuretic foods which help you to release this fluid potential. These are onions, beans, green, uh, leafy greens, pineapple, parsley, grapes, beets, asparagus, all which help you to kind of combat some of this potential. So, again, if this is something that you're experiencing, kind of building more of these foods into your diet can be a beneficial thing. Raise blood sugar, if that's something that you suffer from on, on steroids, uh, then avoiding these refined carbohydrates and sugars, eating balanced meals, and also kind of be careful things like fruit juices and alcohol especially, because they would be really, uh, really unhelpful in terms of balancing blood sugars. Raise bad cholesterol, this LDL cholesterol is another one. Uh, so again, these refined carbohydrates have shown, particularly fructose in things, so fruit juices and high fructose corn syrup are processed foods, have been shown to increase uh, your LDL cholesterol, so remove those from your diet. Um, increase your intake of fiber rich, uh, soluble fiber rich foods, so things like vegetables, fruit, and oats as well can be kind of beneficial. And if you are overweight, losing weight um, has been the one that kind of had the biggest effects in terms of reducing your LDL cholesterol as well, so that can be another uh, area to kind of focus on. One of the other problems we see with immunosuppressants in particular is this kind of impact on the gut, side effects on your gut. So this can be cramps, diarrhea, constipation, uh, and these can be much more complex to kind of look at. And looking after our gut uh, is going to be quite a helpful way for us to stay out of combat these um, side effects, but also to stay healthy in general. So there's some things we're going to want to kind of talk about here in terms of essential fatty acids, fiber intake, your balance of your good and bad bacteria in your gut, how quickly your gut motility, how quickly things move through you. So if you're not sure uh, how fast your gut processing is, you can try eating some sweet corn and then watching how quickly it takes to come out at the other end. And you'll know roughly what your transit time is then. And you can kind of monitor how these things were affected uh, by your drugs. Um, you may not want to show people, but it's um, quite, quite a fun way of seeing how it can be. Are you someone who takes antibiotics a lot? Have you been traveling? All of these things are things to consider about when looking at your gut health. So let's take one of these things. So you're, in your gut, we have this, this nice picture here of a healthy gut wall. So you can see here these little tight junctions between the cells and these little fingers that stick out in terms of absorbing nutrients. And this is a compromised gut wall where we have this erosion of these little fingers and gaps between these tight junctions. And we know that uh, when we have an eroded gut wall, this can lead to inflammation. And one of the things we can influence our gut is the bacteria we have in our gut. So we typically, the typical gut has 160 different bacterial strains. And the large intestine has the greater colonization of all these bacterial strains. There are more bacteria in our body than there are cells. Some of the roles of these bacteria are to stimulate these, the cells to produce these antimicrobial peptides. They increase this mu mucus secretion, which can uh, pr protect the gut walls. They improve this gut motility and the tight junctions between our cells. They can compete with pathogens for sites, so it means they can stop nasties from attaching themselves to, uh, to our gut wall. We synthesize vitamins in the gut wall. And we also change uh, biotransformed steroid hormones and drugs, all sorts of your gut. And your gut bacteria is what can influence your immune tolerance. We talked about earlier, how we, whether we react to self or not, and what degree we have. So having a healthy microflora is really important. So how do we get the healthy microflora? Well, what these bacteria love is they love fiber. So a fiber-rich diet, again, uh, unrefined grains, lots of fruit and vegetables, they're going to love. They also love omega-3 fatty acids. Why? Because they help the good bacteria to stick to our gut wall. So that's also going to be really kind of beneficial. The immune tissue in our gut um, is really sensitive. So we know that stress uh, can destroy the balance between this good and bad bacteria. We know um, that alcohol is also very bad in terms of this balance between this good and bad bacteria. So there's lots of things we can do to help ourselves kind of remain healthy here. If you're not sure about how your gut function, uh, how good it is, then think to yourself, am I someone who falls into one of these lists? Have I, do I currently or have I previously used lots of antibiotics? If you have, when you take antibiotics, what you are wiping out all the bacteria, good and bad, in your gut. So that may be an opportunity for you to put some beneficial bacteria back in by taking a probiotic 
supplement for like a month or so after you've taken my antibiotics. Do you have IBS symptoms as alternating between constipation or diarrhea? Have you had gastroenteritis when abroad uh, or parasitic infection in the past? Uh, do you take antacids or PPIs repeatedly? Because that will also uh, affect your kind of gut function and your uh, balance in bacteria. Do I have low stomach acid? So you may find, if you're someone who eats a piece of meat and you know it kind of sits on you late at night and you feel it's not, you're not really digesting it very well, you may be someone who doesn't produce enough uh, stomach acid, in which case we can find it takes you longer for breakdown of foods or large particles of food are coming undigested of proteins are coming into your gut and causing bad bacteria uh, to proliferate. So that could be about something very simple by using lemon juice or by vinegar on your food in order to help break down some of those proteins. You also want to consider whether you think you have any food intolerances, so things like lactose or gluten, fructose, you know about that cause a reaction for you. They are, that's something you may want to start looking into trying eliminating these foods from your diet for a period and then reintroducing them to see if it makes a difference. And stress. We know that stress negatively impacts your gut. Anyone who suffers from IBS will tell you that when they're going through a particularly stressful period, their gut symptoms will be a lot worse. We know there's a communication system between the gut and our brains. So, food sensitivities. If you do suspect you have any of these, then try and identify these foods, as I said, and remove them for a period of time and then reintroduce it. So I would constantly say, if you think you are affected by something like wheat or dairy, remove it for two weeks from your diet and then reintroduce. You may find it makes no difference whatsoever, in which case it means you haven't needlessly excluded the food for any long period of time. You want to have a nice varied diet, but this way you can kind of gaze to yourself. Is it something that has a serious impact or not? If it is, great, you've identified it. You can then have a healthier gut or a nicer feeling gut that symptoms going forward. So lastly, just to kind of summarize a few of the points mentioned is increasing our oily fish intake this omega-3 uh, anti-inflammatory fatty acids a smaller handful of nuts and seeds a day can also be beneficial in terms of um, the good omega-6 oils also plenty of studies that are showing that consuming 10 almonds a day helps to reduce your cholesterol because the lignans these phytochemicals in the, in the nuts and the seeds have been beneficial at reducing uh, bad cholesterol Aim for seven portions of these brightly coloured fruit and veg. You can get the nutrients, the fibre and all these phytochemicals that we talked about. Avoid refined carbohydrates and sugars to help keep your blood sugar levels balanced to avoid uh, producing unless releasing unnecessary amounts of insulin. Choose these whole grain starchy carbohydrates mm -hmm. instead, but have them more towards the kind of breakfast and lunch in the day rather than in your evening meal. And limit your intake of animal fats and switch to leaner cuts of meat. And the last part of here, I don't want to be a killjoy, so I've kind of put alcohol with a question mark, is uh, there are some evidence to show that a small amount of alcohol can be beneficial to us in terms of long-term health, but all the evidence shows that too much alcohol uh, is detrimental in terms of our gut bacteria, uh, in terms of our blood sugar balance, and in terms of inflammation. So there's a kind of limit here in terms of uh, uh, questioning yourself uh, whether you really want how much alcohol you should have. And my rule is always be have the alcohol that you enjoy, the glass you enjoy, not the ones that become habit or that you think you should have. Um, so if you always go home and have a glass of wine because that's who you are, is that the glass of wine that you really want? Or is the glass of wine that one you want with friends on a you know, Friday evening with a nice meal? It's about questioning how much things become habit and how much things you really, you really enjoy. So other recommendations uh, in terms uh, of uh, lifestyle recognitions is to ensure this adequate amount of sleep, so seven to eight hours of sleep a night. Exercise regularly, reduce your stress, which I know is easier said than done, uh, and to maintain, uh, what you maintain what I mean, a healthy weight. So if your body mass index is above 25, you want to keep that, you want to keep your body mass index below 25. Another one here is also measuring your height to waist ratio. I think this is often a better one to do. Because our body mass index just looks at your uh, height and your weight kind of ratio. But actually what we really want to know is about body composition. And we know that fat mass, particularly around the middle, it used to be thought it was just like an inert mass that just sat there. And now uh, with research we've realised that it's not just inert, it's that this extra um, uh, fat, especially around the middle, actually has its own messages, its own uh, chemicals, which can be pro-inflammatory. 
So again, having large amounts of fat around the middle is going to be a pro-inflammatory state for the body. So again, reducing that weight. So looking at your waist to waist to height ratio, in the wrong way, height to ratio should be 0.5 or below. So if it's above 0.5, and you might want to uh, tighten that one waistline. That's that's the whistle stop tour. Um, so any questions or anything? Not a great meat eat meat at all. Yeah. How, how, how do I get nearly almost a kilogram of protein a day? So, well, I don't eat a kilogram of protein a day as it is. Yeah, so um, there's not there's lots of other uh, non-meat uh, sources. So would you eat any fish at all or not really? Sometimes. Will you eat eggs? Yeah. So eggs are a great source of protein. So there's about uh, 8 to 10 grams of protein per egg uh, in there. So we've got nuts, you've got pulses, so lentils, chickpeas, all these things are good sources of protein too. A can of baked beans has a nice amount of protein in it too. Uh, it has a little bit of salt and sugar, apart from that. So, so you can certainly get an adequate amount of protein just by looking at foods like soy, uh, nuts and pulses, um, eggs. Certainly you can do that. It just means you need to be a little bit more consistent about having protein in every meal. So it means that if you're, not, if you're having, let's say, just toast for breakfast, um, pasta for lunch or something like that, it means you're putting a lot of pressure on your evening meal to get that protein in. So having a little bit, having protein every meal is going to make life a lot easier for you. A bottle of wine at the weekend of the meal does that constitute uh, too much oil? So, uh, so, the, so the new recommendation for the, for the government, the government says is that um, it's uh, 14 units of alcohol a week for men and women. Uh, so a bottle of wine, I think, is about seven and a half units. Don't know how much that. Um, so nice. nice. So let's say seven to nine <laughs> units. Uh, we, but technically, anything more than two drinks at one time is binge drinking. Mm. Two glasses so, of wine. So two glasses. Oh, two. Yeah, two glasses. Two, two glasses of wine. If you have a long meal, it takes two glasses. Yes, but I think it depends on. You have to kind of weigh into account how over how good your diet and lifestyle is overall. And if that is your indulgence for the week with a meal and you enjoy it. I'm not going to take these things away from you, <laughs> but I think it's a question of how frequently that, if that's happening three or four times a week, then maybe you no, want to kind of bring that back in. Um, so, yes, but, it, but, it's, but, it's, it's, but look at the bottle, bottle of wine and see kind of the units in that, but also look in terms of the calories that you're having that. So if you're going through a period of what, say you're taking steroids and you're trying to keep your weight under control, alcohol then is not going to be your friend at all. So there can may be some periods where you want to avoid alcohol and some periods where it's actually okay for you to have your indulgences here and there. The same with chocolates and all these things. It's a, it's a bit about you know, finding, your, uh, finding your, your treat and putting it into context of what you're trying to achieve. Is it, is it better to have your vegetables and carrots and broccoli uncooked? And does cooking kind of alter the nutritional so value? It's really interesting, does cooking affect the nutritional value? So we know that heating um, uh, vitamins C and B vitamins are destroyed with heating. So we do know that you're better off then eating certain fruits, especially people trying to get the B vitamins or vitamin C, eating them raw. However, lycopene, which is one of these phytochemicals in tomatoes, is actually when you cook tomatoes, the lycopene becomes enhanced. So it's you're better off then with tomato paste than you are eating a raw tomato then to get that lycopene out. It's also, we know that having a bit of oil on your carotenoids improves the absorption uh, of these in your body. So essentially it's a bit of a balance to be had. So having some raw and some cooked is going to be a nice kind of half medium. There's a difference between lightly steaming your broccoli and boiling it to death so there's only stalks left. So you, again, you have to use a little bit of kind of common sense. Steaming is going to be a better way of, of, of doing that. So this time of year, having salads and things is lovely. You mentioned brightly coloured vegetables a couple of times. Is that yeah. just the nice descriptive phrase, or are there some vegetables that are not brightly coloured? So we know that uh, there's a different. So there are different uh, phytochemicals and nutrients in different coloured vegetables. Mm -hmm. So the idea of eating the rainbow is to make sure you're being exposed to this whole array of different phytochemicals. Um, so it's an easy way of, kind of thinking about it. And also means that we don't become stuck eating just the same types of veg all day, like I'm just eating peas and broccoli, or I just eat carrots, you know. It means we kind of force ourselves to be a little bit um, 
more adventurous because we do find that if you're anything like me your shop becomes exactly the same foods each week so it's trying to push yourself to eat seasonally to eat a kind of wide range of different 